Thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's The Podcast Academy webinar on the art and science of immersive sound design. We're excited to have you here. And again, wear your headphones because that's going to give you the best experience for anything that has to do with immersive audio, as our experts will share. Before we dive in, I want to thank our community building sponsor, Wondery, for underwriting this program. And invite you all, if you're not a member of TPA, to join our thousand strong virtual community across the world. If you're not yet a member, we will be emailing you a 50% off code, or you can preempt that. I'll put my email in there and just say, hey, Amanda, send me that code. And I will happily do that after this webinar. Um, if you have questions as well, we do have James and Steve as uh, excellent involved members at TPA, and I'm sure they can also answer those questions maybe later. But enough about me. Thank you again. Welcome. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists for this here webinar on, again, the art and science of immersive sound design. First up, I'm going to introduce in alphabetical order, Charlie Hewitt, who is the founder and president of Mirror Studios. Hey, Charlie. And Charlie is a uh, lifelong recording engineer, musician, and mixer. He started in the music industry and has journeyed through the transition to, from analog to digital and subsequently to stereo 5.1 surround and now Dolby Atmos. From his early love of storytelling through music, it was a natural progression to the art of sound design and as a re-recording mixer for television, film, and now the brave new world of immersive audio for podcasting and audio storytelling, we're really happy to have Charlie here. To Charlie's, uh, well, for me, right, we have Cheryl Ottenritter, who is the founder, creative director, and lead mixer at Ott House Audio. With over 20 years of experience belying her useful appearance in the art and science of sound, she has worked with PBS, National Geographic, Smithsonian, and Discovery Channels, among many clients that you may have heard of. Maybe they're kind of a big deal. Certainly, we have the wonderful Steve Lack of Steve Lack Audio. Steve has produced podcasts for NPR, Warner Brothers Discovery, Al Jazeera, and started Steve Lack Audio, very succinct, to help independent producers create podcasts and audiobooks. Steve is also on the board of uh, Women in Film and Video and is a supervising producer for their weekly podcast, Media and Movements, Monuments, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> he is very active in the podcast academy where he serves on the uh, membership and the outreach and education committees please join tpa members and some of his recent podcasts are dating while gray hosted by laura stasi our body politic with barai chidea and the podcaster versions of um, warner brothers discovery television's expedition unknown and the nightmare next door finally last but certainly not least we have the wonderful facilitator who's going to be talking through this whole wonderful panel, James Walker, who is the founder and CEO of Velocity Studios. Like all these incredible panelists, James has decades of experience in the magic of audio as heard on television, in movies, and of course in podcasts. So James, it is now your turn. I will let you take it away. And thank you again so much, everybody. Thank you, Amanda. You're a hard person to follow. But you're so amazing. Thank you for putting this all together. Really appreciate it. Hello, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. I am a evangelist for immersive audio and love talking about it with everybody that I meet and I can uh, connect with. And when Amanda and I first talked a few months ago about doing this, I said, I'm on board. Let's do this. Kind of contact us, Steve, and we we're able to put this together for you. So thank you for making the time today to hear from these great panelists. When I first got into the creative arts, um, it was producing independent film. And my first movie was a contained action thriller in the trunk of a car. And it was an amazing masterclass on the job masterclass that audiences will always question what they see but they'll never question what they hear and from that experience to today i have always strived to work on projects where we push the the bounds or my experience in audio storytelling so um i'm really excited for these for, for you to hear how these panelists are doing that and first off we're going to bring you steve lack He's going to give us a very basic and introductory understanding of what is spatial and immersive audio, and then we'll get into some pretty cool meaty things with Charlie and Cheryl. But Steve, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you and, and introduce us to the world of spatial and immersive audio. Great. Thanks. Yeah, when, I, when James and I first started talking about this, um, the first question that came up is, well, what's the difference between spatial and immersive? And uh, so I started doing a little bit of research on that. 
And it turns out for as many people as are working in this, there are that many different opinions on what the difference between spatial and immersive is. So I sort of tried to codify based on kind of a consensus of what I saw on the forums and discussion groups and other people I talked to, kind of what it all means. And I, I put together just a quick presentation on that just to so that the terminology that we start talking about during this webinar will be somewhat familiar. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, okay, I think I'm sharing my screen. So basically what I found is a, a spatial audio. And this uh, another thing I want to preface this with is this has kind of changed a little bit because Apple refers to their, their technology as spatial audio. And what Apple's doing is using their actual hardware to create a, along with which we'll get into later, the Dolby Atmos mixes and binaural mixes and things. They're using gyroscopes and things in their hardware to create head movement and uh, and a more immersive experience. But spatial audio primarily focuses on localization of sound in a three-dimensional space. So it's the sound around you. Um, and when we talk about immersive audio, that kind of extends this concept by creating a more captivating audio experience that brings in additional elements, a lot more movement, kind of immerses you in the sound. So while well, when we say spatial audio, we're, that's a component of immersive audio, not all spatial audio is necessarily considered immersive audio, if that's not too confusing. So spatial audio kind of refers to the perception of sound in the 3D space. And it kind of aims to replicate the way you hear sounds in the real world. So you'll hear things behind you or above your head or coming. I know when I when I first set up a system, I was over at Cheryl's playing around uh, one day. And the the first thing I do is make an airplane fly over your head or or make somebody walk from behind you to the front of the room. Those that's basically spatial audio and it can be achieved through many different ways, binaural recording, multi-channel audio systems. Um, mostly what I do is I do, I'm doing a lot of up mixes and things from stereo versions. So you can use plugins that use reverb and phase shifting to kind of create a simulated 3D sound. Um, so it'll produce the spatial characteristics, but uh, and make it feel like the sound is coming from many different directions even if your original recording was just a mono or stereo recording, you can create this spatial audio. Um, it doesn't, when you're talking about spatial audio, we're not talking about a fixed channel configuration like 5.1 or, or 7.1, 7.2.1, that it can be implemented using various channel layouts, including, like I mentioned, stereo, surround, or binaural mix for headphones. Um, Immersive audio, in my world, in my definition, on the other hand, is a, is a broader concept. It, it encompasses spatial audio, but it adds additional elements. Um, it, see, as you'll hear from some of these great examples later on, it creates this engrossing immersive audio experience that puts you right in the middle of the sound. And it involves more, they call it object-based audio, which allows sound sources to be treated as independent objects in a 3D space. So from a mixer standpoint, it's kind of a, a different way of looking at your storytelling, your audio storytelling, than we're used to with a stereo mix or even a, a spatial mix. Dolby Atmos is really the leading specific audio technology that uses object-based audio. Um, I was reading about a new, there's a new format maybe that we can address later from Google uh, that's trying to compete with Dolby, but I think it's in the very early stages right now um, called IAMF. But Dolby Atmos is really the leading immersive audio encoding and mixing system. Um, so why would you want to use this in a podcast? Well, by placing sound in a 3D space, you can really draw your your listeners into your content, and I'll get into some examples of that later, um, after after we hear from Cheryl and Charlie. 
about how you actually use that and, and what it accomplishes. But the other thing that I like to tell my clients is, you know, there's about 30 bazillion podcasts that are um, uploaded every day. So how do you stand out as a podcaster in that in this field? And, and one way is production values, having good sound quality. Don't sound like you recorded it on your MacBook speaker, having a decent mix and, and more and more having an immersive or spatial audio sound will help you kind of um, stand out from the crowd of all those other podcasts. And as more of these platforms are, are adopting immersive audio standards, you'll be more likely to be featured and put in their discovery systems and, and uh, discovered by listeners. Um, the terms that, that I've been throwing around here and that we'll talk about just quickly, and then I'll turn it back over to James, is uh, binaural. When I say binaural, that, that literally means using both ears. So binaural mimic, mimics the way that humans hear sound in the real world by capturing differences in time, intensity, the phase between sounds when they enter your left and right ear gives you more of a directional feel. Ambisonics is uh, it's a, an older recording technique. It's been around a while, but it's designed to represent sound in a spherical kind of a 3D um, space. So you can record with an ambisonic microphone or a microphone array that captures sound from all directions, which is kind of cool if you're doing like events or live broadcasts and things like that, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Um, and then that can be placed in the mix and decoded for playback over different speaker setups or binaural rendering for headphones. And then Dolby Atmos, which is going to be really the focus of most of this presentation, is an advanced audio technology that provides immersive and 3D audio experience. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, unlike traditional surround sound formats that rely on channel-based audio, such as you know left, right, left, center, or left, right, center, left, surround, right, surround, um, Dolby Atmos separates things. They use an object-oriented approach so that sound can freely move around the listeners in the 3D space. And uh, I believe, yeah, and that, now I will turn it back over to James. Thanks, Steve. That was yeah. great. So, and, and and we really wanted to make sure that that all the participants get this very basic understanding as a producer, or a writer, or um, or anybody in the creative team putting together a podcast, I think it's important for us to understand the tools that these amazing mixers are using, because it just helps frame what is possible with that initial story idea you have, and where you can go from it, and really bring it to your audience. Um, so with that, Steve, thanks again for for giving us that introduction. Now we're getting some fun. We're gonna we're gonna dive into Dolby Atmos and listen to some samples and hear from. Cheryl and Charlie about the challenges and the opportunities of how to take what the producers, me, wanted and make it sound really, really cool. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Cheryl and, and then we'll, we'll have Charlie uh, follow up with that too. So Cheryl, you've got the floor. Thanks, hey everyone. Um, one thing I just wanna address right out the bat is that especially um, for me when I dove into immersive podcasting was that it, it was very, very clear to me that script writing and the approach to story um, was key to being able to exploit all the opportunities for um, for immersive sound. But the other the other thing is that it, it can be applied no matter what the story is, um, whether it's just two people having a conversation and you put them in the space the way you want them to have an intimate conversation or, or you know, even something as simple as that. So I don't want everybody to feel like you have to have, before I play this, that you have to have all this action and all this sound going around to, uh, to, exploit, the, uh, to, to exploit Dolby Atmos, um, because it really does give <clears throat> uh, intimate conversations um, pre a lot of presence as well. And also nat sound, where it, natural sound, if you're trying to, uh, recreate sound in the, from the wilderness or like uh, Steve said, the event, uh, it, it, there's, it, it really crosses all, 
all type of story form. Um, I'm going to play something from a Wondery episode that we did. Um, I didn't even know that they were sponsors today, so um, I, I, I'm going to play just a few seconds here or there and try to have the renderer up. Let me share my screen. See if that is good. There we go. Am I going to share the desktop? Thank you, Cheryl. And if you don't mind moving a little closer to your mic as well. Sure, I can do that. Awesome. There we go. Yeah. Just redid our desk, so it's a little bit um, different there. Okay, so I'm just making sure everybody can see my screen. Is that good? Looks great. Yeah, okay. Let's see here. Let me turn off my mic. Also clinging to the ropes. The raft is somehow still intact, but it's stuck on the face of the boulder, pointing up towards the sky. They try to shake the raft free, but the surging water is pinning it to the rock. Then, Yossi looks to his left, and his stomach drops. The boulder and the raft are teetering at the top of a waterfall. The water around them is cascading over the edge of a 12-foot drop. Even if they can get the raft loose, they'll be swept over the waterfall and plunged into even more dangerous rapids. Yossi clings to the raft for dear life and wonders if this raging river is the last thing he'll ever see. That was just one short example. Um, one thing that um, uh, Steve talked about was objects. And so I wanted to make sure that you saw objects, but then suddenly my machine is not showing objects. So that's a little embarrassing, but you know, um, it all works. So let me just make sure the setup is fine. Mm, yeah, it looks good. I don't know. Um, so most things I, I, I uh, play with uh, Foley and I put everything into different folders so I can easily just uh, route everything uh, for the effects. But the thing is, is that it's all story related. So if you have a story like this, Yossi Gins opens his mouth to scream, but instead chokes on a mouthful of river. The raft is going over the waterfall and taking him with it. He wraps his hands around the ropes and shuts his eyes. He feels a sickening moment of free fall, then a crash, then suffocating, otherworldly silence. He's underwater. He opens his eyes and sees nothing but darkness. His lungs burn, and he's still gripping the ropes. Is he upside down? Is the raft completely submerged? He can't tell. <gasps> Suddenly, the river spits him to the surface. He gasps in relief. And I'm gonna um, play again, so you can see it. Hold on. Mouth, mouth, uh. Chokes on a mouthful of river. The raft is going so over the waterfall and taking him with it. Cheryl, he wraps so his hands around the ropes and shuts his eyes. I'm sorry, Amanda, what? Um, unfortunately, when you speak over it, we can't quite hear what you're saying. I just wanted to bring ah, that to your attention okay. in case you <laughs> I, I should have something. known that. So um, <laughs> anyway, so the if you could, you saw the objects going and, and, and the green balls, we call them the dancing green balls, and you can see that you can have the height and then you can have everything around you. And you can actually feel the person going underwater and then coming back up. And so the the vocalization of the voice giving you the instruction of what's going on helps, but you could have this whole scene and still feel it without the voice. And so talking about story is, is really, really important and how you approach story. So like, are you going to describe what you're hearing or are you going to set it up? Or are you just gonna let the listener 
uh, envelop it. Um, so there's so to totally different ways to approach um, your writing, your scripting, and your direction to your sound designer. Um, and as a sound designer, when you're looking at a script, you know, you can uh, take cues from the producer and the script notes, and you, but you should write your own and feel like, okay, I'm, I'm free from the screen um, or I'm free to do whatever I want because it, it is an audio first story. So I feel like that is really, really important um, to understand and to release yourself as whether a sound designer or a producer or um, what, whatever to understand that you are, you, you are free to create this world around you uh, using objects uh, and beds. And the one thing that uh, I think Steve mentioned was um, ambisonics. And I love using ambisonics in, in uh, a sound design because it actually uh, gives a really full feeling and it starts to create that world as like a, a layer. And, and that's a, a really good thing to do. We do a lot of work for National Geographic and National Geographic Society where um, we're constantly pulling in explorer sounds and manipulating them. Unfortunately, I, I'm not allowed to play those today. So, um, uh, but if you want a private screening, just let me know. Um, but, uh, it, so there's lots of different ways to do that and let the Nat sound, say for instance, create your world. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of I'm I'm kind of out of something to say. I don't know. It's, it's no, that, that was great, me. Cheryl. That, that really was. That really was. <laughs> no, um, and, and, and I can tell you as a producer, sitting in uh, a mix booth with my my designer and mixers and watching the balls move around. The first time I saw that, that was really cool. I was like, wow! And then we can hear it just in the room, just everything move around. It was it was really really neat. Or just put yeah. it there, put it there. And, uh, and and play with yeah. them both on cans and and and, and the room was was so awesome. Yeah. Um, so Charlie, we're going to put you on to chat a little bit about your experience with Dolby Atmos and and your challenge this past year with taking theatrical motion picture screenplays and turning them into audio dramas. And and these are big visual action movies. These are big visual stories. And how do you how do you use Dolby Atmos to solve this storytelling challenge? Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Charlie, and um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm just trying to sense where to drop in here. But um, I I am a as far as a mixer is concerned for me, I'm all about the subtleties in mixing, if that makes any sense. And um, so the the fun thing about Dolby Atmos or backing up to 5.1 or the tools that we have available to us today is like all the crazy stuff that we can do. But I always think it's it's so important to remember that they're just tools. And so Cheryl speaks so succinctly about the fact that it all comes back to the story. So because we have the, uh, the opportunity with a joystick to move objects around the room doesn't mean we should. Um, and so we wanna make sure that it doesn't become gimmicky just because we can move things around. And if you close your eyes in a movie, what does it sound like? And so um, I was approached to do the, uh, a full-blown Dolby Atmos uh, soundtrack for uh, a motion picture. The only thing that was missing was the picture. And so when we started peeling this apart with regards to the script, it became very clear that we, as the sound designers and engineers, had to paint that picture. And, and so what, what producers saved in physical production um, ended up, some of that has to come back to the post house where you're actually, we become the physical producers because we have to design things that you are going to experience and we need to paint that picture but just from an audio perspective i'll give you an example one was from a sound design perspective this particular show that that i'm going to share with you um is called the metal detective and it's set in the future and it's an action piece and there's machine guns and all sorts of stuff well if we wanted to create the the sense that this is a sci-fi piece in the future with robots and and in this particular case, they call them synthetic life forms are called Newmans and, and humans. 
So would a machine gun still sound like it does today? Well, if we depart too far from what they sound like today, people are going to wonder what it is. So can we do a blend? Can we use a machine gun, but also add an electronic piece to it, which might that might be, you know, it's, we're just making it up, right? What is it supposed to sound like in the future? So, but if we give it a, a just a little bit of a pre-roll on the actual sound, then you know it's coming. And and uh, so as we as we listen through, we hear these subtle little things and we, our auditory senses will pick it up and we go, oh, that's just like you would if you heard a gun cocking or something like that. So the the idea of Dolby Atmos mixing for me is is exhilarating. It's the next step of having being able to be on the stage and have a an environment unfold around you. And and then from a binaural perspective, throw the throw the cans on and listen to it through headphones and see the subtleties, the difference between what you hear in the headphones versus what you're hearing on the stage and make those uh, those little tweaks as well. So I'll give you an example of, of one here. Um, let me start the, share the screen. And this this first one is, is a, um, is just a, this piece here, is uh, the machine guns that I spoke of. And it's just an opening sequence that has, um, uh, it's an open, it's the opening sequence for the metal detective. And it it's a, as the way the story unfolds and it's kind of self-explanatory. So you'll hear it's here, so. So the uh, that opening sequence, as you can see, you're in you're in the in the belly of an airplane, and you've got people talking around you, and the and the uh, a, a fight ensues as a robot goes nuts. Um, the 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 delicacy I was referring to for me is I want to hear all of these sounds around me, but at the end of the day, the most important one is the dialogue. Right? We we need to be able to hear. Um, we need to be able to hear that. So in this particular case, it's actual dialogue. There's multiple actors. I, I can't remember how big the, the, the cast was, but it was not insignificant. And they were placed around the room, much like they would be if there was a picture in front of you. And um, so I, I like to surmise that I see with my ears and, um, and so when I'm, when telling that story, I, I don't want it to get, too far out of the realm of that doesn't make any sense but at the same time we want to expand our our capabilities or our 
our listening experience. And so that's where Dolby Atmos is, is so spectacular. Um, I really, really enjoy that opportunity to use the objects and and the beds in order to just um, dive in, if you will, to to that world of immersive audio. So, and by the way, Steve, thanks for explaining or pointing out the difference between spatial and immersive. Because if you'd asked me, I'd have gone hell. I don't know. It's like it's just all around you. So, <laughs> thank you for being very eloquent about the way you did that. So, I'll hand it back to you, James. Thanks, Charlie. I really appreciate that. I know we're having a lot of questions coming into the Q&A, and we still have quite a bit to get through. So I'm going to hand it back over to Steve to talk a little bit about, about sound design in nonfiction, or I should say immersive audio for nonfiction and documentary audio storytelling. Um, and then we're going to get into a really important aspect of immersive audio, which is mastering, which I, I, I don't think a lot of people pay attention to, but has become, I think, the the secret sauce for a lot of mixers, and then we'll get into Q&A. So we'll try to speed this up so that we can uh, get everybody's questions answered in, in the time that uh, Amanda has given us. So Steve, you've got the floor. All right. Yeah, I'll, I can zip through this real quick. I just wanted to give some examples of why you would use uh, spatial immersive audio in your podcast and how you would do it. So, you know, if you're producing a documentary style story, nonfiction content, documentary, documentary and investigative journalism, a great way to use that is to kind of place people where you are um, and in order to enhance the story. I did a, a podcast, a, it was a local public affairs podcast about traffic problems in Richmond. And it was an in-studio interview. But then what we did is we went and took some traffic and kind of uh, made it sound like it was running along behind it was real simple but made it sound like it's running along behind the interview so they were out on the street and so that's a way you can make your your listeners kind of feel a little more involved in what you're talking about using this technology um another great use for it is event coverage um if you're if you're doing a podcast from an event or about an event or a conference things like that you know just just getting the room tone getting the sound of the presentations, sound of the crowd, and then mixing that in with your either your commentary or your voiceover or with the actual feed from what's happening in the events. Um, it can also make you feel like you're in the room, you know, hear things going on around you. Uh, another way you can use it in, in an interview or conversation style podcast, which I've done this quite a bit, is you'll have three or four guests and you can kind of envision them sitting around a table. So you'll just put people just slightly off to the right, slightly rear right. So it feels like you're sitting at the table. And then the cool thing with that, with the um, Apple spatial technology and some other head, head tracking technologies is if when you're listening to someone and you hear them go like this, you hear them talking from here. I don't know if you see me or not, but uh you hear him talking like from the side right, you'll automatically turn your head. And with the head tracking technology, it will make them now feel like they're in front of you. So that's a that's a great way to use it in an interview style podcast with multiple guests. Um, another thing that I love is when you're doing field recordings or, or location-based content for any kind of a podcast, get the ambient sound. We did a, a podcast um, near the James River and you can hear the river in the background. So the first thing I had to do when I was doing the mix was actually remove the river from the audio recording so that I could hear the speakers and get the get a good sound on, on the interview. Then I put the river back in, again, same way we do with the traffic. So it sounds like it's kind of flowing along behind them. So it sounds like we're we are we were at the bank of the river but you can feel it now you feel like you're there with us so um those are yeah that's all i got on that but those are those are a bunch of ways that you can uh utilize this technology i love it i love it and it's so important to also remember that though you know cheryl and, and charlie are really pushing the boundaries of what we call, i call audio dramas you know audio storytelling in that that scripted fiction world um, so much of podcasting is interview based, is is uh, nonfiction based, uh, is weekly. So, adding immersive elements just to your background, to your sound design, 
gives such a more inclusive experience for your listeners. So hopefully there's some people here um, that are joining that are doing that and can benefit from, from that discussion. Thanks so much, Steve. That was really great. So now we're going to jump into mastering. Um, and that is something that most people have never heard of. I didn't even really know what it was till I was told hey, we're finalizing our show. We got a master's. So what? So uh, I want to bring back Cheryl and, and Charlie back on to give us a, a understand what is mastering. And for those doing audio dramas or scripted audio st storytelling, why you should consider this, not only in your Dolby Atmos mix, but with everything you're doing and how important it is. So uh, Cheryl, I'll bring you back on. Thanks. I had to switch mics. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Yep. Um, so for mastering, that's always been a bugaboo. Like whether you're mastering for picture or podcast or whatever in Dolby Atmos, it's always been, you know, a challenge. Um, the way we approach it here is we actually um, use master faders, 128 master faders for each voice in Dolby, Dolby Atmos. And then we, we true peak limited or do whatever global processing that we want, the special sauce and mastering, if you will, live through the master feeds out to um, the renderer. And that works really well for the Dolby Atmos um, uh, mix. And yet it doesn't contain it because there's uh, so, many, so much going on in the renderer, especially when it's uh, outputting for stereo or binaural, there's so much going on um, with True Peak, that you have to, well, at least we we found the best way is to uh, contain those True Peaks after you output the stereo mix and you you put it, you know, you master it for True Peak. Usually, um, if you're watching everything just fine, that's all we have to do. We really work very hard in like making sure that all the levels, all the specs, all the sound is complete coming out of the renderer so that we don't have to actually remix for stereo or remix for 5.1. And it's it's been a trial and error process over the last, what, six or seven years for us on this. Um, and this is what's been working the best for us is the master um, for mastering. Um, and uh, occasionally we don't have to do true peak limiting uh, for the stereo occasionally, but usually it's, it's un an un unfortunate part of the process at the moment. Thanks. Thanks, Cheryl. So, Charlie, um, tell us a little bit about your experience with mastering and uh, how you've approached it in as a as a challenge and solution with the audio work you're working on. Yeah. So um, much like Cheryl um, in in Dolby Atmos, um, we 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 kind of master it as we go um, so that we um, the the peak limiting and whatnot it it will you'll kick it back in QC if in quality control if if things get out of hand and get too gangly so we and so the sitting on the stage and the levels are great and and this is a Dolby Atmos mix sitting on a on a, a big stage which is um, I, I know is not um, always available for for people certainly people that are starting out and and mixers. So, but a lot of people are, are mixing in headphones and with a binaural setting and they're, they're, they're mixing in that environment. And when we did this, this show, The Metal Detective, we, on the stage, we listened to it in, in Dolby Atmos. Then we did a binaural uh, mix, or a, I should say a binaural render. And when we listened to it back on the stage, it sounded wonderful. When I listened to it back on um, the sound bar or coming out of a computer or just dropping it in into just headphones that's now coming through a different processor. Every scenario, it sounded a little bit different and not always in a good way. So um, it struck me that I cut my teeth in, in the audio industry on music. And when we were mixing, and I'm dating myself here, but when we were mixing records and then CDs, um, we would mix a song and set it aside and you mix song two and you set it aside and you mix song three, but we would never release that onto a final distribution and send it out to the world without it going to a mastering engineer. And a mastering engineer is literally that special sauce. They take, our job is to put 24, 30, uh, 48 tracks, whatever it is, however many faders you have and mix down this great song. And then 
we have song one, two, three, four, five. And then a mastering engineer says, how does song one relate to song six? How does song two relate to song 11? And so you want to make sure your record, uh, the playing level is all consistent through there. And they'll bring out the, and a mastering engineer can, can articulate some of the delicacies in a mix. They can bring out, they can tighten up the low end just a little bit, make it a little bit punchier. They can bring some of those high mids out in the vocals so that they sit a little higher in the mix. All of those little things and mastering engineers are magical. And it occurred to me when I was listening through these binaural mixes that, oh my gosh, how how crazy that we're thinking that we can send this out into the world without mastering this. So we sat down internally and started going through this process. We grab three, four, five minutes of the show and, and do a mastering process, render it out. Or after it came out of the binaural renderer and we would master it post a binaural render and then we would throw it back in and then we went through and and uh, some eqs and some multi-band compressions and whatnot and we probably did a hundred different mixes before we went oh my gosh i think i think we're on to something here where it really did hold up it held up in your car it held up on coming out of your phone you could literally listen to it on your phone and you could hear obviously not you like you would if you were in cans but you could sense the space that was going on and and so it became it was just remembering from where I came, which is it's important to take that mastering is that last thousand grit sandpaper. It's just it's the icing on the cake, you know. So so to me, that's what mastering is. So um, and and we hadn't found we hadn't found that process currently in in um, in this part of the industry in podcasts and immersive audio. And, and so we kind of, uh, we went through and documented all of the pieces that we were doing and we called it IAX, which is the immersive audio experience. And that's our, our particular proprietary mastering process that we put through. So that's. Cool. Cool. We have just a few minutes left before we getting a Q and A. Charlie, I think you had a, another clip you wanted to share or are you good? I, I'm good. I think we're good. Yeah. Cool. I, all right. Cool. The folks that are on here, it's, um, it, we're at Mirror Studios. So if you have any questions after the after this is done, please don't hesitate to send. Uh, if you go to mirrorstudios.com, there's an opportunity there to send in some emails and we'd happily answer it. See if we can answer any questions you have if we can't get to it today. So, Okay, great. Uh, we got 13 minutes and I'm going to try to handle all these Q&As. Uh, we got a lot of great questions coming in. Let me try to do, uh, let's start at the top from Sean um dolby atmos versus thx spatial audio creator i've heard of it we haven't used it i've talked to thx folks but i'm not familiar with it and uh cheryl charlie have you guys used thx spatial audio creator at all i have not so no. great, great question sean but I, I i have not used uh thx spatial audio creator so I, I can't speak to it yeah okay sorry sean um joshua asks uh any recommendations on tutorials for adult for Atmos and Pro Tools, uh, he's most interested in setting up and, and set up and busing to ensure his templates are properly laid out for both deliverables and mixing. You want to take that one, Cheryl? I, I there's there's a couple YouTube there's a couple YouTube pieces that lay out um, the I/O setups in Pro Tools that will um, that are pretty, pretty darn good. It is clear as mud when you open up the Dolby renderer for the first time and you're going, okay, uh, this is, this is all new for me. So um, it took us um, for our particular stage, and I'm sure Cheryl experienced this too. It, it took us the better part of a good day to, to go through on your IO setups and log everything out. And of course, we're, we're we separate things out i don't know how cheryl works but it, at our shop we separate things out in uh dialogue music backgrounds sound effects and foley so we have five basic beds that are different um folders headings that we work under and and then we set up our um we set up our 
um, renderer the same way, which interfaces with Pro Tools. And by the way, I hear that um, there'll be maybe there may be a, an integration of render include in an upcoming portion of uh, Pro Tools. Just something I heard on the street. So who knows? But um, but I think if you Joshua, if you check um, on on um, YouTube, I think there's some real nice tutorials on there. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's where we were given a little guidelines. So. I love YouTube. When they always fails, there's something there. Oh, um, yeah. Can I jump in real quick? There's, no, go, yeah, uh, please, Steve, come. It's not Dolby Atmos, but there's a great tutorial or kind of an overview um, from the New York Times R&D division on how they approached using spatial audio and podcasts. And I'll drop the link in the chat, but it talks about systems they used, storytelling techniques. There's It's really great, like public service that they put out there of here was our journey from how to create spatial podcasting. So um, just on the subject of tutorials, I wanted to just mention that. Cool. Well, um, my only thought about, I'm sorry, my only thought about jumping into it is the fact that um, try not try not to base everything on how you mix stereo or 5.1. Right. Just, you know, uh, just don't have those constraints. I know it's hard because that's how we were all brought up in the industry, but um, throw everything, co caution to the wind and just go for it. And otherwise, you know, cause, and use your ears, your ears are your best tool. You know, if it sounds bad, it's bad. If it sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, Mark asks, are your Atmos mixes targeted at binaural headphone only, uh, listeners? Do you mix for the native Atmos format overhead speakers and all? As a, I, and I'll quickly just jump in on that as a producer. I wanted my podcast, my audio dramas, to be able to be heard wherever the audience is and to be experienced in the most immersive way. And most people listen to them on earbuds with a phone. So that's where I turn to my mixers and say, make it sound as great in this room there. But I'll let Cheryl and Charlie quickly answer that question. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Um, are your Atmos mixes targeted at binaural, headphone only listeners or do you mix for it for the native Atmos format, overhead speakers and all? Yes, all of it, all the time. Because that's the that's the purpose of Dolby Atmos is that it can be transported to whatever environment it's going to be heard in that you're going to listen in. It's go it's going to uh, decode where they think you are listening, whether it's a sound bar, you know, a full setup um your headphones in the car it's, it's going to detect that and it's going to play it back uh for the mixer intent uh as best as it can one thing i do want to mention is that when you are mastering one thing that a lot of people overlook is the trim levels in in the uh in the renderer um i started really playing with those um uh, about a year or two ago and discovered that it really did make a difference in my stereo uh, mixes and stuff. And, and that along with the, the, the processing that I put on the master faders really helped with that mastering stage. Um, so I don't know if that helps you at all, but you constantly, like, like Charlie was saying, constantly be listening on different, different formats, you know, just like you do for a regular, you know, surround mixing, you know, 2.0 on the smalls, you know, TV and your iPad or, you know, however, wherever you feel like it's going to go. But again, once you mixed it, it's out of your hands. What Dolby gives you is that it's encapsulated so that it reads your intent and plays it back to the best of the technology that's available when it's being played back. I yeah. think uh, uh, one thing that I, I did notice that I always kind of bear in mind, and that is that I'll go back and forth between headphones and the stage. And and so, uh, again, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that we have a, a lovely stage to work on. An interesting thing that um, our ears um, do, and that is that when we're on the stage, if you're in a live environment on the stage, for example, if you're mixing in a room, if you pan something hard left, your right ear will still hear it. It's going to be to the left, but I, I can still hear it in my right ear. If I have headphones on and I pan all the way to the left, I can only hear it in my left ear. So when I go back and forth between listening and, and, and with just my ears in the room through the speakers and then put the headphones on, 
it sometimes it's just an ever so slight subtlety that you'll change in the mix so that it 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 translates very well between the stage and headphones. Um, I, I hope that helps. But um, as Cheryl said, we're paging back and forth all the time. If I have it on Atmos and I hear it all the way around me, I have the opportunity to, to reach next to me and hit a button and I want to hear it in stereo. Boom, I, I can hear that entire mix sucked down into stereo. Then I can do the same thing and have the whole thing come out of my center channel. I can hear the entire mix in mono. And and some people are, are that's the way they're going to hear it. So we want to make sure that we don't uh, disenfranchise a listener because we only mixed it for forty speakers. We want to make sure that people are listening to it on two and getting the same experience or getting as a, a robust experience. Cool. Uh, another question from Mark: What are some of your favorite spatial audio seven dot one dot two format reverb plugins? for creating realistic spaces. So maybe Steve, this is something you can answer for creating those realistic soundscapes. Well, I, I think Cheryl will agree with oh. me on this. I really love um, the Liquisonics uh, cinematic rooms a lot. And that's basically all I use for reverb. So. Great. Um, going through Q&A here. Uh, we had... just came out with it, Altaverb just came out with theirs, but it's not silicone. It, or no, it's just now silicone. Right? Yeah, Altaverb's cool. great too. <laughs> I think we answered this for Joshua already. He asked about how we're dealing with loudness levels of monitoring, and and Cheryl, you're talking about trimming. But is there anything else, uh, Charlie, Steve, Cheryl? Can, talk about loudness levels. Yeah, I I basically I'm 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 like for what I'm doing, I'm always looking at loudness, and I'm mixing to loudness, and um, coming from TV, my ears were kind of attuned to minus 23 and now working in podcasts so much, um, everything I'm doing, I'm trying to hit minus 16 with a, a true peak of minus 1.0. Actually, I try for minus 2.0, but I miss it every time, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I can get it. You can get away with minus 1.0 in, in podcasts. Um, I think YouTube's minus 14, but I, I've never done that. So um i guess i have to i should look at that but yeah i really focus on uh, uh trying to hit minus 16 luffs the the in the renderer the the lkfs uh you know monitoring is pretty good if you really want to get in the weeds you could feed back in the stereo into your pro tools and put you know a regular LKFS monitor on that. So you can side by side, see what's happening with the renderer and your output to stereo. Um, uh, I don't do that anymore. I used to, um, but now like Steve says, I just kind of, my ear knows um, and I get it in the zone pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but yeah. Cool. Uh, Cheryl, we got a question directly to, to you from Brandon. He was curious about the, and it's the technical part of this. Um, within PT, within what third-party plugins uh, plugins do you need and what is the file format output that it gets down mixed to for the listener to experience Dolby in their earbuds? So Pro Tools, I believe he means Pro Tools. Yeah. Charlie, you may have some experience too. So within Pro Tools, what are the third-party plugins you need and what is the file format output that it gets down mixed to for the listener to experience Dolby in their earbuds? Well, cur currently, uh, that th Cheryl and I are both using, and that is that we use the Dolby Atmos renderer. And the, so the renderer is outside of Pro Tools currently. So it's not a plugin a third party plug the the third party uh application is the Dolby Atmos renderer and and so you send your mix um you send your mixing session through so your your output of your pro tools session is Dolby audio bridge instead of HDX cards and then input to um, the input side of your Dolby renderer is Dolby Audio Bridge, and your output then goes out to your speakers. And then you, you as Cheryl was saying, you master and you can do all of your rendering within the Dolby um, renderer. That's that's the third party application. Uh 
the one real quick thing I want to add to that is that in the renderer, you can um, export after you make your ADM, which is the Atmos master, you can export an MP4. And then that can travel anywhere um, and, and it can play the Dolby Atmos at a two point though that, that can feed to your headphones um, and or vice versa. You can output your uh, discrete uh, 7.1.2 and bring it into Logic and actually export an Apple Spatial. So you can hear it in Apple Spatial or without some of the funky stuff they do in Apple uh, too as well. And the one uh, plugin I use because unfortunately I don't always get stems or whatever is new gen, new gen halo uh, for the upmixing. Everything else is pretty standard, um, you know, for, for what you're doing in, in Atmos. It doesn't, uh, there's not a lot of uh, big, enormous cost to jump into the fray. I'd say just do it and have fun. Yeah. I use awesome. new gen halo. Oh, sorry. I was going to oh. say, I use new gen halo also to upmix. I get stems from discovery to repurpose into podcasts from TV shows. And I'll use Nugent Halo to just make that an easy process. Thanks everybody. We're at the top of the hour and I think our tour of duty is done on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's so much more conversation to go we just wanted to thank everybody for joining us it's been a real pleasure we have such a lively chat a lot of really great questions we know we didn't get to all of them but that's okay if you're a tpa member please bring it over to slack i'm gonna go right ahead and stop the recording but i want to remind folks um, we appreciate you we have many more coming ahead and thank you again so much for joining us um i've been amanda james steve charlie cheryl what an excellent talk we appreciate you